Well, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you're listening online, on YouTube and Facebook. Welcome to the Experience Renewal on this glorious, wonderful day. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what Experience actually means. It's from the Latin root word. It means spirit. And in this case, we're referring to the Holy Spirit, Experience Sanctus. In addition, it means breath, which correlates with the Spirit because in a biblical context, we're discussing how Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the apostles at Pentecost, which gave them renewal and purpose and boldness in their faith in Jesus Christ as they ventured out into the world to answer the will of God to make the world a better place. So what are we offering today at today's uh, Spiritus Renewal? Well, first, we invoke the Holy Spirit as Manny did, with praise and worship, to open our hearts and our mind to the speaker, who will give us insight and wisdom based on Ephesians 6.11, wearing the armor of God, especially during these turbulent times. This allows us to become more tuned in with the Holy Spirit, and it opens our hearts so that we can hear and listen to what God is trying to tell each one of us. The speaker, Father James Flynn will give witness and testimony to us so that we know and understand that we're not alone in our struggles, but we can overcome any of them with Jesus at our side. He will help us be renewed in our faith so that we can become a strong disciple of Christ in today's world. After his talk, we will have a question and answer session with Father Flynn. You will then be able to ask Father directly questions and concerns that you personally have on your own faith journey as it relates to wearing the armor of God. Send your questions to Catholic Brothers for Christ on their Facebook page or YouTube page, and Father will answer them as best he can as time permits. We will follow up with a personal reflection from our newly ordained Deacon Paul Mahoney from St. Francis of Assisi in Grapevine, who not long ago was sitting in a pews just like us, asking God to guide him on his personal faith journey. We will then conclude with adoration of the Blessed Sacrament so that we can contemplate in our hearts in deep prayer to see where God is calling us and asking each of us to do in our lives. So why are we doing this? Well, Catholic Brothers for Christ are committed to building the body of Christ and uniting as brothers and witnessing the gospel in all aspects of our life. Our mission is to help men of the same mindset and facilitate a positive change in our culture and our society. We can't wait for other people to do this. So in order to make these changes that are necessary in our culture, we must change ourselves first so that we can encourage change in those around us. Our vision is to make men the spiritual leaders of their household. It is only through their leadership that they will be able to propagate the faith to their children. Our mission comes straight from St. Paul in Romans 12:2, where he says, Do not conform yourself to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is pleasing and perfect. And our core values are the Beatitudes, in which Jesus teaches us how to live daily. So as you can see, the Experience Renewal can be life-changing. It is, it is meant to help men become spiritual leaders, in which they need to be to change their society. So my challenge to you is this. Listen with an open heart. Remove the busyness of the world for the next two hours. Enjoy the moment. Allow God to speak through the speakers and through the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist to you today. So there you have it. The meaning and purpose of Experience Renewal. I hope that God will continue to bless you and guide you in becoming the men that you need to become. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker an incredible man of God, a combat army war veteran, graduate of Texas A&M University, 
Born and raised in Granbury, Texas, he's currently the pastor of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Keller, Texas. I'd like to introduce Father James Flynn. Thank you, Father. That's not true. We are doing question and answers first, and then how much time? Do we, how much time did I take? Okay. Father, we have a number of questions, and we also have a number of very affirming comments. Uh, one individual wants to uh, say thank you to your father for displaying uh, humility of faith that you described uh, as a three-war Marine Corps colonel. So thanks to your father. Right, yes, absolutely. Uh, the first question we have, Father, is are there moments in time when a particular piece of the armor of God that you discussed may be more helpful than another piece? And if so, could you share an example, please? Well, I mean, I, I would say probably the most important thing is that breastplate of righteousness. You know, you can do a lot with a sword. You can do a lot with a club. You can do a lot with a sniper. You can do a lot with a rifle. Right? You can, but I, I think having the breastplate alone, right, in, that, in the moments of the uh, difficulty helps us, right, be confident enough to battle Satan himself, right? So I think the breastplate for me has, has been important because that's the righteousness, those are the actions and attitudes and words and demeanor by which we give ourselves over. I think as we go out in our daily life, that's what people notice about you. They, they can see whether you are a consistent Christian or not. They can see by your attitudes and actions and words who you are, especially your children, if you have children. They, they, can, they can pick out a fraud in no time. So if, you, if you're just speaking or not acting the actions, your children will know. They'll see it and they'll discern it. So be righteous. Right? I think that's the most important thing we do. Thank you, Father Flynn. Our next question is, what's your advice for helping me to stay clothed in the armor of God when arrows and bullets are being shot at me from various sources? Well, I mean, it's difficult. You know, all of your plans and all of your intentions and all of the best laid plans of war all go out the window the moment the first bullet goes down range. Right? It, chaos ensues. That's, that's the sort of chaos Satan wants. So I, I think doing what Jesus Christ did, going away and praying. Yesterday we heard in our gospel how, how Jesus went out in solitude and prayed. I think too often we forget that, that we need to commune with God. Just like Jesus Christ did. If the second person of the Trinity had to go off in solitude and pray, how much more for us who are human? Right? Sometimes a soldier needs R&R. &R, right? Sometimes a soldier needs to be pulled back from the front lines and take some time to get their act together, to heal from their injuries. Then they can go back nourished and refreshed into the battle and win. So right, if you're feeling overwhelmed by the battle, if you're feeling overwhelmed by God's trust in you, Right, to handle it, go away by yourself. Spend some time in front of the Blessed Sacrament praying. Take you a holy hour somewhere, somehow, every day. Right, and that way you can be nourished for the fight. Father, Mike has asked, do you have any advice for how to handle friends who have antipathy towards the church hierarchy? Well, okay, so the question is about antipathy towards the church hierarchy. That, Satan will always try to divide us, right? He, he'll always try to get us to be separated from one another. You know, Christ prayed in John, I pray, Father, that they may be one, as you and I are one. And so, right, even when Catholics have some antipathy or some anger or some frustration, against certain members of the hierarchy. We always have to remember, right, what did Jesus Christ say about the Pharisees? 
Right? When they were asked, when, when they were asked by a good disciple, what about the Pharisees? Jesus said, do whatever they tell you. Do whatever they tell you. Right? That's, that's part of our obedience. Being obedient to our, to our hierarchy, to the magisterium. That, that's what, I mean, yes, the Eucharist makes us Catholic, yes. Our unity makes us Catholic. Yes, the oneness of our faith makes us Catholic. But what makes us uniquely Catholic is the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ not only came in the flesh, that he founded a church, and that church is guided by the Holy Spirit. He, and Jesus chose himself 12 men. One of those 12 turned out to be Judas. I think the Lord did that on purpose. And I think he did that specifically because he wanted to let us know that no matter what one of the people I have chosen does, the message that I bring is still true. So, right, the message that the church brings through men who are sinful, which we all are, that, that sin doesn't take away the truth. And so we, we focus in on the word of Jesus Christ, on the power of the whole magisterium of the church, which is the bishop and all the line of, of excuse me, the pope and all the lines of popes before, all the popes that will come after, all of the bishops together in union. And not to get so focused on the division which Satan wants us to have. Because inevitably, if Jesus Christ himself just chose 12 and only 11 we're righteous. That means it's probably pretty true of the modern day. And so, stay focused on the church that Christ founded, not the individual people that make up this church. Well, the next question I think comes from your comments about the gentleman who came up to you at, at the store and, and wanted to pray with you when you were in your, in your uniform, if you will. It says, when it comes to discipleship, what advice do you have for me to become more confident in my ability to share the good news of Christ with others? You know, it's just doing it. I mean, really, that, that's the answer. Like, how do you become more confident in this? To just do it. We, we were out at a hotel, and uh, we were having a little conference with Amazing Parish, uh, and... There was a, a lady who came walking by, and she had her guitar on her back, and I said, uh, oh, are you gonna play us a song? And she kind of laughed and said, no, I'm going out by the pool, and I'm going to write a song. And I was like, oh, well, what kind of music do you play? She said, well, you know, I really like your kind of folk music. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And, and I said, uh, well, what are you gonna write about? And she said, well, you know, my marriage is in trouble and things aren't going well at home. And I was like, ah, I'm just the guy to talk to about that. Let's go off and pray. So we walked over and I asked her about her marriage and what was going on and, and, and all the things that were happening with her. And, and then I said, well, do you mind if I pray with you? And she said, please do. And I just prayed with her. I think if we take the opportunities, you know, if your spouse or children or friends or family or co-workers are going through a tough time, how do you build the confidence in order to engage them in faith? By doing it. By doing it. By being a person who takes the initiative to say, yeah, you know what? Man, I feel you. I wish I had the words to comfort you in this, but I don't. But I do have the words of Christ, which I know will give you fortitude. So let us pray together. That's how we build our confidence. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. I'm sure this young man, I was not his first, his first approach. And he probably has made a lifestyle of that. The only way to do that is to do it. Start small. Start with your family and friends. Are you even doing it with them? And move closer, uh, move out as your circle of influences, and then you'll reach more and more. Father, both 
Nick and Keegan online have a similar question for you, and, they, and they're very intrigued at your comments. They'd like to know when and how you converted to atheism, and what is it that brought you back to your Catholic Christian faith? So, uh, I, it was really science that brought me back to the faith. So, I, the long and the short of it is I was in fluid dynamics. So, if you're an engineer, you probably took it. Uh, a course in fluid dynamics. Now that's, I want to say that was my junior year, uh, might have been my second semester, my sophomore year, I can't, I can't exactly remember, but anyway, wherever fluid dynamics falls within the course of study of engineering, uh, I studied engineering at A&M. Uh, we've already had physics, I and mean, we had several semesters of physics already, and we were talking about fluid going through a system. Uh, this, in this case, it was a hydraulic system, and so, how it worked, and he said, you know, don't forget to get the right viscosity of the fluid going through and the effects of gravity on this system. And, and I remember thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, what is gravity? I mean, I know it's a force that acts on things that have mass at 9.8 meters per second squared, or in America, let's say 32 feet per second squared, right? But what is it? Well, it's a force. Well, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What is it made of? Well, nobody knows. Well, the, nowadays there's some things about boson spin two particles and other things that are in play, but none of those are provable yet. So, right, uh, we don't know. And yet, we know, right, if I take these stack of paper and I drop it, it's going to fall at that 32 feet per second square. So, right, uh, Minus wind. But for us, for me, that, that was an interesting thing because science is all about proof. We'll hear an atheist say, prove God exists. Show him. Show me. Well, here's a miracle. That doesn't prove anything. That could have been, you know, medicine. Okay, well, here's the creation rule. No. Well, here's this. Here's that. Here's another. No, no, no. But then when I asked the professor, I said, uh, Professor, what is gravity? And he was like, I, you, you're like a, a junior or whatever we were. You should know. I was like, yeah, I know it's a force, but what is it? There's no answer. And so I said, show it to me. And he dropped some, a book. And I said, no, you just proved that a book falls down. You did not prove that gravity exists. You didn't show me gravity. You just showed the force that it moves. Christians will say, and I, this was what's going on in my mind, I thought, people who believe in God say, no, I can't show him to you, but I can show you how he works in my life, much like the professor did with the book. He took the book, he dropped it, it fell. We, we prove God almost in that same way. Yeah, we can't, I can't just say, here's God. So now you can believe in him. Just like I can't say, here's gravity. You can't smell it, touch it, taste it, hear it. But you feel it. And we feel God's love and God's providence within us. That started, I mean, that, that just started a long process for me. Uh, eventually, I came to the notion that you, you can't, matter is neither created nor destroyed. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. That's thermodynamics. And yet, how did this get here? How did this get here? It had to be, if it's neither created nor destroyed, where did it all come from? It had to come from something. And nothing can't create something and something can't create itself. So the only answer is that something created it all without being itself being created. I didn't even know that's from Thomas Aquinas. I didn't know that then, I just came to that conclusion by thinking about physics and thinking about the creation of the universe. Since then, right, I, I have a whole course that I give on scientific atheism. And I always enjoy coming across scientific atheists 
you know, people often ask me, well, how do, you, how do I convince a scientific atheist to believe in God? And I, I usually say something that's fairly shocking and many people get a little, a little offended by. I say encourage them to take their scientific atheism to its logical end. Encourage them, because most people, they say, well, I believe in science and not God, and they don't know anything about either. They watch a YouTube video and think that they know about science and physics and entropy and, and thermodynamics. They haven't really studied it. They, they just watched a 10 minute video on some atheist talking about these different aspects. But if you, I think for me, even though I was an atheist, I wanted to know that which was eternal and true. I just didn't believe it was God that was eternal and true. But I, I had the thirst for knowing that which was more perfect than myself. And so I think that's what led me back to God. But I think so many people in the modern day, they, they're just skeptics. They don't believe in science, they don't believe in God. That's, that's a difficult place to be. I don't know how to reach atheists just yet in that respect. But, but I do know, right, if you can, if you can get an atheist to sit quietly and think. Eventually, they, they'll find the faith. They just, most of them won't do it. Father, um, you know, the COVID-19 era has got a lot of people concerned and worried and scared and kind of hunkered down. Um, and we've got a question from XE Unity who says, uh, is the mark of the beast coming soon and how will we know? Well, I mean, is it coming soon? I wish I knew. But, but I do know this. I remember back in 2000, right, the Y2K, of those of you who are old like me, right, remember the scare of Y2K, right? And, and, and people were asking, they asked, at that time it was uh, Cardinal Ratzinger who became Pope Benedict. He was the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And they asked him, so is, is the year 2000 going to be the end of the world? And I don't remember his exact response, but it had something to do with, well, first of all, the year 2000 is not the year 2000 that we're growing calendars off a couple of years, so the year 2000 already happened. So obviously no. But he also said, what would that change? I mean, let's say we knew the day and the hour. Let's just say we, we could know that the end times are here, and the mark of the beast is there, and, the, and all of these things. Let's do it, we could just come into a day. What would that change in your life? Well, many people would say, well, you know, I'm not going to confession, I get annoyed, I you know, do this, I do that. Well, do that anyway. Like, wait, why, why wait? Go to Mass, pray, read Scripture, read your catechism, right? do adoration, go to confession. Make sure you're concentrating on your marriage and your family and your children. Make sure that's the most important thing in your life, is God and your family. Then it doesn't matter. And people, there are people every single day who pull out into traffic and don't come home. They, they didn't know that was their last day. Dude, we recently you know, had the anniversary of 9-11. Those people who went into the World Trade Center, they didn't know going to work, what that was going to happen. But it did. You don't know when Christ is going to call you home, but he will. So, so that being the case, the question is, who, what, it shouldn't change a thing. I should be ready and doing what I'm supposed to be doing and thinking what I'm supposed to be thinking and saying what I'm supposed to be saying all the time. It's not like I, I gear up because I don't know. I don't know when the enemy will come and take my life. I don't know when this world ends and the next begins. That's why I want to be prepared regardless of when it is. So, I mean, I guess, you know, I, the, the real answer is I don't, I don't know exactly. But uh, be ready. Because the truth of the matter is either the world's going to end or you're going to end. So, be ready. 
This is our last question, Father, and we have a number of questions that we weren't able to get to, which we want to just say thank you to everybody who posed the questions on Facebook and on YouTube, and we'll post those to Father to follow up with answers. Uh, we also have some more affirmation comments, and some people have wanted to just say thank you for your comments about the importance of sharing your faith with your children and how your children how your children can see if you're fake or you're authentic, so more affirmation. Um, the question focuses in on, there's uh, some individuals who've talked about that this COVID-19 era has gotten them and some of their loved ones down in the dumps, frankly. And so they're looking for the, the advice you have for them beyond just praying to help them come out of their haze. And, and here's the zinger, it's how would you best describe sensing God's grace in our midst? Well, I mean, uh, uh, um, if you're a Christian of St. Elizabeth Van Seen, you, you, you've heard me talk about some of this already. And one of the things that I, I learned in the Army, especially, uh, really especially in those years I was in the Army, was if you take the worst part and you embrace it, now you can do something about it. So I remember when I first got to basic training, you know, when you get there the first day, you're just scared, right? You've got, you know, I had Drill Sergeant Lockhart right there yelling and screaming in my face and, and, and dropping me for push-ups and you just, I was scared. I felt alone. I asked myself, why did I do this? Right? And, and oftentimes I think in the modern day, we, it can be the same, why, why is this happening? What's going on? I don't like it. But, but after many weeks of basic training and advanced training, by the end, right, we, we would say things like, we like it, we love it, we want more of it, make it hurt, drill sergeant, make it hurt, we're wrong. Right? We, and he would drop us for push-ups, and we would do our 20 push-ups, and he'd say, recover. We wouldn't just get up, I'd say, you recover in the hospital, drill sergeant, oh, you want to keep pushing then? Well, you keep pushing, right? And you just keep pushing. Right? We, we would encourage him to make it worse and worse. And why, now, why would we do that? Why, why would, I mean, why would you put yourself through more misery? Because pain is weakness leaving the body. Right? When we embrace the difficulty of this COVID, we embrace the difficulty of wearing masks and social distancing and, and, and all of this craziness. For me, at first, you know, I was a little resentful. But then I started thinking about my life in the military, and I began doing the same thing to kind of COVID that I, we did to Ryan Drill Sergeant. Oh, you want me to wear a mask? What else you got? <laughs> mask, that's nothing. Oh, you want me to social distance? Watch me do that. I can social distance like a champ. I don't like most people anyway. No, I'm joking, I'm totally. Right, oh, you want me to not be able to travel? I'll be happy right where I'm at. Right, I mean, I think, Right, the Lord says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Not pick up your cross when it's convenient, when you like it, when you think it's fun, when it's, you know, looks impressive to your friends. He says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. When we pick up our cross, we now, and I, and I use this word cautiously, yeah, you have some control over it, though, don't you? Right, if it's just sitting on the sidelines, if you just push your cross away, it, it's, it's still tethered to you. You just have no control over it. It now controls you. It's like more like an anchor. But when you pick up your cross like Jesus Christ did, now it moves with you and doesn't stop you from any movement at all. Right? And it gets you to the place you want to be. Because just as the cross of Christ brought all mankind salvation, Christ gives you and I a cross every day. And if we bear it and hold it and move with it and it moves with us, it will take us to salvation. If we try to ignore it or push it away or have cross envy, well, their cross isn't as big as my cross. Well, maybe yours is made of styrofoam and theirs is made of lead. But you don't know what, what people's cross is. We don't have cross envy. Just have your cross. 
and then right if it becomes too heavy don't worry there are other Christian people there to help you with it that that's what they what we did with Christ right we see we see that Simeon comes and helps him with the cross he picks it up for Christ so, so what is it when we do as Christian people when we see people buckled under the weight of their cross? Well, there, there was most of the Jews looked at Jesus on the ground and spit on him and, and called him names and kicked on him. But one man picked it up and walked with him. What do we do when we see somebody who's fallen under the weight of their cross? Fallen under the weight of, of the pressure that the world puts on them. Many times we blame them. He's weak. He's stupid. He's evil. He's this. He's that. He's not a good person anyway. But what we're called to do is help, help them carry the cross. So that's what I would encourage you to do. If you're buckling under the weight of your own cross, call these guys. They'll help. Call me. I'll help. If you see somebody else doing it, you help them pick it up and move with them. Because it didn't just bring Jesus salvation, it brought all of us salvation. So if Christ gives you a cross, and we all have crosses right now, we've all always had crosses. Carry it valiantly. If it gets too heavy, ask for help. During this time of COVID, if, if things seem overwhelming, pick up your cross. And if you think, gosh, this is too big, it's too heavy. I just do what I did in the army. That's all you got? Let's add a few bricks to this sucker. Right, let's, yeah, give me a bear over. I can handle it. Yeah, mask, bring it. Social distance, fine. Right, not being able to travel, cool. Right, is that all you got? I'm still happy. Ha. Ah, I'm still good. So, uh, I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, but when you can embrace the difficulty and embrace the cross, now it moves with you. And now it becomes a means of salvation and not just an anchor that drags you down. And so be excited and thank God for the trials and tribulations you're going through. And say, yeah, I got this, God. I got my friends to back me up. I got the scriptures and the armor of Christ to protect me. Let's keep going in deeper into battle. Is it? Without going into battle, we can never win. Uh, we worked through a lot of things uh, to make this happen, and I really appreciate all your time and effort. If you're listening online, please feel, feel free to join us. Join our mission, our cause. Become an ambassador to your parish. Uh, become a part of our leadership team. If you can, donate to our cause so that we can put on more events like this. Most important, we want you to leave today a little bit better, a little bit further in your faith journey. We pray that uh, Father Flynn has given you insight, that God has moved through him to work into your life and in your family. So once again, thank you for coming to the Experience Use Renewal. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.